Um, my name is Rita Chin, and I am one of the associate deans at Rackham, and um, I have the privilege of um, leading our Faculty Allies program. Um, so our third workshop is really seeking to help all of us think about how to engage in racialized change um, in our graduate programs and in the academy more generally. And I'm really pleased um, that we have uh, a very um, interesting speaker um, to help us think about this kind of racialized change work um, in Heather McCambly, who is an assistant professor of critical higher education policy at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she uses qualitative and quantitative methods to study the role of organizations in reproducing or producing systemic racial inequalities. Um, and she does this work with a commitment to producing knowledge that can help us collectively build alternative pathways to just futures for um, underrepresented students um, and institutions. Um, so her various lines of work include racial justice centered research on critical quantitative method methodologies, faculty hiring, post uh, federal post secondary um, policy and politics, and private philanthropy. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to welcome Heather um, to Rackham virtually today, um, and. Um, you know, thank you for for being here and for sharing your work and um, your expertise with us. Thanks so much, Rita, and thank you also to Kristen for all of um, her work and helping to make this event happen. Um, and to other folks at Rackham for welcoming me here. I'm so happy uh, to be in community with you all. So let me go ahead and get uh, my screen sharing going. One moment here. All right, that should, so it's loading. Well, I don't want that. So while I am getting my technology, which was working a minute ago to work the way I want it to, um, as Rita said, I am an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I have um, been doing work in higher education, thinking about issues of racial equity since um, I think before I even finished undergrad, but then I also did spend 10 years um, working in um, at the, the institution level doing uh, racial diversity and equity work starting in um, Oregon, going to the state level, and have worked in a number of um, federal and national initiatives over time, all before I decided that I was a little bit stuck around um, why with all of the racial equity initiatives that we're doing, does it seem like everything is more the same than not. And so I kind of went back to graduate school with questions in my mind about what makes change work, what makes change stick. Um, and that's kind of the driving force uh, underlying my work. And it's a really interesting time, right, to be thinking about that particular topic. It's an interesting climate to come together as allies uh, for racial justice or equity, whatever language we may use. Um, we're living in a time when DEI work in higher education is both ubiquitous and highly contested, um, and perhaps more contested than it has been in the last 50 years. So I want to also just acknowledge that even as we face kind of incredible challenges, we're really um, working and dedicated to more just futures in the academy. Um, and we have to continue to envision how do we expand and reckon with the futures we want and we would imagine um, for black, brown and poverty affected students um, and otherwise minoritized peoples in our places and spaces. So something that I'd like to do is just to kind of be in community for a moment and get a sense of all of your voices without um, necessarily having time to talk kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I wanna have you participate in a um, waterfall activity. I don't know if you've ever done one of those on Zoom. So make, pull up your chat box for me really quick. And we're gonna do two brief 
waterfalls. And what that means is I'm gonna give you a prompt or a question and I want you to type up your response, um, but don't hit enter until I give the go ahead. And it's kind of a nice way to see all at once our commonalities, uh, differences across the group in terms of responses. And so feel free to be candid. Um, so the first question I wanna ask this group, um, just to get us warmed up is uh, type in a word or phrase that describes the first thing that comes to mind when you see a new DEI initiative announced. We'll give everybody a few seconds. Oh, <laughs> it's okay, Zach. It always happens to at least one person, right? All right, so we'll count down from five. A word or phrase comes to mind when you see a new DEI initiative. Four, three, two, one, and waterfall. Cautiously optimistic. Excitement, what is this one? Exasperation, hopeful-ish. Good opportunity for mentees, service, curiosity. Will it work? Yep. So I think this is a nice capture of kind of a range of responses we can have. And I, I hear this a lot. And as I said, it kind of drives one area of my work, which is even in excitement, kind of noticing, is this one going to work? Is this one gonna stick? The exasperation can often come from another one, but did we finish the last one? Did the last one stick around, right? And that type of questioning. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, those thoughts and words. For our second one, I want you to think about a current DEI initiative or goal. It can be in your department, your school, just for you within your lab, um, but something that you care about as a faculty ally. So again, um, type, type it up, hold it for a few seconds. I'll let you know when to go. A DEI um, initiative that you care about right now as a faculty ally. All right, Stephen, you'll kick us off. So four, three, two, one, go. All right, see grad students, visibility, diversifying our faculty racially, recruitment, mentorship, training, hiring. Read is all about our this, this ally group. Bridge to the doctorate program, faculty diversity, reaching out reaching out to LGBTQIA plus students, community building. Beautiful. Okay, so that is, um, that gets us started. Let's see, because I want you to now take that um, kind of area that you're thinking about, caring about right now, and just take a moment to make sure that um, you are holding in your mind as I go through this presentation um, about this particular initiative or goal um, kind of what it is, what you see as the goals, who is or needs to be involved, and how you know, how you're going to know if it's successful. And those questions will be up on the screen in just a moment. So we'll come back to your individual example at the end. And my hope is that this, um, holding this in your mind will uh, increase your opportunity as I walk through the framework that I'm going to share with you today um, to draw some connections about what these things I've been thinking about and helping other people apply out in the world. What, what you know, one or two things could you grab from it and apply, you know, to this project or initiative that you really care about? So we'll come back to that at the end and try to uh, formulate some takeaways. So with that, um, feel free to keep taking any notes down to yourself that you want to, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep going. So thank you for what you shared so far. And um, as you all know, presenting while you're on Zoom, it can be hard to see the chat, but I welcome you to chat with each other, drop in comments. And if anybody wants to unmute and just pause to ask a question, I, will, I would welcome that. Um, and we'll try to, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to hear over yourself talking, but I'll be paying attention. So a quick overview of the time that we have together. 
So I'm going to give you an overview of a framework I've developed and applied um, focused on how we create meaningful rather than performative change with regard to racial equity in our work. And we can really think of similar things when we think of kind of other minoritized identities. And hopefully you'll, you'll kind of see why as we go through why I would say that. Um, as I go, I'm gonna offer exemplars to ground the ideas in practice relevant at the level of departments, of programs, um, and I'm happy to take questions as I go. Um, and then we'll move into small group workshopping time right at the near the end and come back to kind of close out and collect our distributed wisdom and ways to move forward. So by way of an introduction to this work, um, I really designed my research program around the underlying question, by what mechanisms does racial injustice or white supremacy as a structured set of processes and outcomes get reproduced over time? And under what conditions are those processes weakened or replaced? So there's abundant empirical evidence locating higher education policies and organizations as sites that routinely reproduce racial inequities across different levels. For example, undergraduate experiences, faculty hiring, which we've heard about, graduate admissions, which we've heard about, um, or even all the way to you know, state funding formulas. So in a context flush with DEI projects, but frustratingly little measurable change, researchers and practitioners alike um, are often need to ask, how can we design for and differentiate between DEI work that erodes racialization in organizations and policy and DEI work that kind of acts as window dressing on the status quo? So put another way, we all know at this point the equity initiatives in higher ed are and have been under varied names kind of plentiful. And yet we also sometimes bring a healthy dose of skepticism of their likely success born out of years of seeing only one of many such initiatives produce the results we might want. So we can reword this focus on hope rather than skepticism, right? We can ask, what do we know about the conditions that make equitable change as systemic as the causes of educational inequity? So one of the foundational frameworks I build on for asking and answering these questions um, is in, aligned with Victor Ray's theory of racialized organizations. He's a sociologist. So we can identify higher education as a collection of racialized organizations. What does that mean? So in this theory, it's organizations rather than individual acts of bias that routinely privilege one racial group over another. So we can identify such organizations by looking at the normed and accepted ways that they deliver unequal resources and privilege um, to dominant groups. And the way that that's institution, that institutionalized outcome, you know, is, is um, there and identifiable. And the core tenets of this theory, or as I think about them, uh, modes of reproduction, right, routinely create inequities. So in this theory, we won't stick in this jargon very long. We're gonna really move over to thinking about practice, but the differentiation uh, between white and non-white organizations or processes is one way that we kind of legitimate unequal resource distribution. So think about the fact that um, MSIs and HBCUs, right, are um, labeled and distinguished in particular ways from normative organizations, which we could also think of as white organizations and the ways that they are differentially treated kind of in a, the ecology of higher ed. Second, the way that whiteness is used as a credential or call towards legitimacy in various processes. Um, and we'll tap on some examples of that shortly. And the racialized decoupling of formal rules in ways that benefit white groups at the expense of minoritized communities. So while this framework is a useful lens for coming to spot and understand how racial uh, equity is so persistent, it's not necessarily intended to help us find our way out of those conditions. So to find our way toward more equitable kind of organizing and practice, we have to think and identify what are the practices, the beliefs that we hold, the routines that we enact um, automatically that consistently reproduce these inequities that we notice without intervention, right? So by intervention, I mean, no one has to go out of their way or express biased beliefs for this process of inequity to continue. So I'll give you an example that I think about often. Um, there has been a great deal of attention lately, and I think it was, there was a write-up in Science, the New York Times, um, other places about how racially inequitable the distribution of NSF and NIH grants are 
in terms of the types of institutions and the types of PIs that receive funding. Um, and we all on this, this call know that has huge implications for what types of labs are funded and well resourced, who gets trained, et cetera. Um, and certainly NSF reviewers, which many of us are or have been, are not routinely looking at the race of the PIs or the racialized categorization of the organizations um, that these PIs are located in and making decisions from a place of individual racial animus, right? But this is often how we are taught to think about racism. Instead, there are routine practices, norms, and criteria that maintain these racialized outcomes. For example, PIs at institutions um, with more robust infrastructure in terms of lab equipment, grant support, and baseline graduate student funding are far more likely to have the space and capacity to put forward grant proposals that are both feasible and competitive under current NSF and NIH standards. This type of infrastructure is also concentrated at predominantly white and wealthy institutions, which is how we kind of get into an ongoing cycle of an equitable distribution, even if reviewers and the funding agencies have the best of intentions. So I'll discuss more um, of these modes of reproduction and examples uh, throughout my description of the framework. But I wonder if you can notice for a moment, what is the mode of reproduction that the DEI initiative that you care about or that you're thinking about? Um, what's that, the mode of reproduction kind of driving that inequity that's been on your mind? Um, what is it the initiative is trying to target and how clear does that feel to you? But also how clear do you feel that is to others? So in my work, I use the phrase or construct racialized chain work to try to discuss and empirically describe projects that are best aligned to target and then weaken or eliminate these types of racialized modes of reproduction. So by definition, racialized change work refers to purposive action that organizations take to build new equitable organizational arrangements or tear down old inequitable ones. So more specifically, uh, racialized change work is the focused attention on dismantling racialized organizations and the routines within them that magnify the agency of dominant groups at the expense of minoritized groups. So specifically, um, RCW helps us think about three primary components of change. And again, I'm not asking you to read all this, just kind of a reference point. So as a construct, it helps us uh, kind of think about the conditions under which racialized change work is likely to be initiated, how attempts at racialized change work either maintain or weaken racialization, and the mechanisms um, by which this work has material and lasting impacts. So for example, in a recent piece um, from Liera and Hernandez in the Review of Higher Education, um, we saw a really interesting vivid example of racialized organizational practice in routines involving faculty hiring processes. So for example, the routine scrutiny placed on candidates of color based on skepticism of the relative quality of their PhD institutions or the rigor of their research and the application of activist labels to candidates of color that discredited their scholarly contributions. So racialized change work in this domain then might look like strategic action to permanently invalidate these types of routines and introduce new ones in their place. So I'll now break down while offering exemplars the three components of RCW, how it spreads, um, how it sticks, and how it has impact as tools for you to think in new ways, I hope, about your own work. So first, we can ask, under what conditions is racialized change work most likely to be initiated? Um, so this first category is based on extensive research about where deep intentional institutional change tends to come from, which indicates that actors who have direct experience with the contradictions of an inequitable status quo will notice and act on the need for change. So the key point here is about connections, which can and does take many measurable forms. So, you know, it is often about representation, right? Representation and faculty among students, among staff, right? It can take the form of other means of connectedness and accountability too, however. So when we think about who are we accountable to and on a regular basis, 
um, kind of in communication with that could surface contradictions in our practice that we don't see, right? Ways that inequity is being um, operationalized and routinely carried out that might not be obvious, right? Without that meaningful representation and types of connections. And it's also about depth of connection, right? So having representation on a committee, right? Having tokenizing, right? Somebody who has a particular phenotypical presentation doesn't mean that folks in our departments with minoritized experiences or identities have equitable power and voice, right? So there's representation, but there's also depth. So we can think about faculty hiring committees as a prime example. So we know from extensive research that networks criteria in in-group thinking have led faculty hiring as a process to be highly reproductive, right? We're recreating what's already in place in, in many cases. So if we think about this tenant, that deeper connections to minoritized communities will create more opportunities for racialized change work, then we can enumerate multiple ways that such connections could be built into the organization of our work. So certainly representation or membership within the committee, um, this often is the go-to and sometimes it's used as a cure-all type of solution, but for many reasons, it's insufficient on its own, right? So deeper connection can also mean power and connections in process. So who has formal power to question criteria um, and routines? How are opportunities to hear from minoritized communities about the process and criteria built into the work? And of course, connections can also ask, who are we accountable to and for what with regard to our processes, with regard to our outcomes? So from this perspective, while we typically think about the endpoint, right, outcomes as our only kind of outcome, which would be the demographics of faculty hires, we can also think about measuring qualitatively and quantitatively organizational shifts along the way that weaken racialization in terms of measures and representations, engagement with routines that create uh, power among minoritized groups, and engagement with routine communications or accountabilities to and with minoritized groups within our communities. So turning to uh, design markers for uh, racialized change projects that will deinstitutionalize inequitable systems and processes, right? We need to understand under what conditions um, mechanisms of racialization are weakened. How would we know? So first, um, drawing from a research base kind of at the intersection of um, race and sociology and um, organizational change, we found that given the routine um, and race evasive ways that inequity is reproduced in the academy, uh, explicitly anti-racist com campaigns or commitments, that is initiatives um, that explicitly target racialized outcomes and processes rather than a rising tides lift all boats approach, um, is more effective in the pursuit of racially just outcomes, right? So taking a, a race conscious approach um, is important and valuable in the initiation of a racialized uh, change work project, right? Because this, the, the way that racism currently operates in organizations, um, as I kind of referred to at the beginning, um, is not a matter of individual open racial animus, it's a matter of routine, right? And often completely race evasive routine that nonetheless um, creates racialized outcomes. So one, an, an anti-racist rather than race neutral project. And second, we have to be willing to act on these commitments, which sounds, this might sound self-evident, self-evident is of course. However, for many in the academy, the status quo We've been socialized in it, right? It's long been naturalized. So that is, that's the nature of hegemony, right? And that's the kind of environment that we work in. We take for granted values and criteria of things like fairness or excellence or best practice um, as universally self-evident. But what about when those universal goods aren't so universally good for all? And what if they perpetuate racialized outcomes? 
So we see this crop up, for example, in the backlash many equity initiatives face regarding fears that they will, uh, quote, lower quality standards, right? So this comes up around issues of admissions. This has come up a lot around affirmative action. Uh, and we have to ask then, are these standards objectively about quality or are these standards sometimes about maintaining the status quo? So to put this into action, um, we see this type of tension come up often in initiatives like broadening participation in STEM. Um, so here I'm using the STEM or NSF kind of term of art, broadening participation specifically. Um, so the way we currently do admissions uh, produces routinely racialized outcomes and is often considered in isolation. So for example, when we talk about increasing um, the admission of graduate students of color, we often get caught up on the application pools being too small. At the same time, we rarely in the same conversation think about things like our undergraduate pedagogy and what it would take to shift pedagogy in ways that systemically changes the pipeline we're faced with every year when we go into the graduate student admissions process. So in terms of change in the present, this also requires reevaluating um, our decision-making criteria. And this is where we inevitably, inevitably bump up against racialized conceptions of excellence or appropriate um, preparation. Right, so starting from this anti-racist stance, right, um, years and years of work just within the NSF on broadening participation has demonstrated um, that a race neutral approach does not close what we often refer to as equity gaps, right? We can increase um, certain types of participation overall, right? Incre we can increase participation in STEM, but when we don't target mechanisms of racialization, the gap between Latin, ind indigenous, um, and black students when compared to other groups, which is not my favorite way to do things, but it's an option, often most typically stays the same and sometimes gets worse. So if we commit to that anti-racist kind of lens on the work, and we also have to reevaluate what our criteria or conceptions um, are that guide how we make admissions decisions which is often extremely uncomfortable. So again, going to measures, what does it look like to find, um, to understand change? So of course, our endpoint measure, enrollment numbers, looking at the demographics of our enrollments. Um, but this is also a much broader overhaul, right? Over time, that requires specific anti-racist commitments that are vertically adopted. So by that, I mean, it's not only at the point of admissions in a given year, but um, a review of, like I had referred to before, undergrad, undergraduate pedagogy, but also outreach, graduate advising, pedagogical design in graduate programs, and support services, right? As well as material and permanent changes to our decision-making criteria that produce racialized results. So while we could um, initiate kind of a temporary program, that could do a whole, a whole lot of kind of recruitment, bring a more diverse pool in for one year. It, uh, systemic kind of racialized change will, will very likely require not only a permanent change in our current admissions kind of criteria and decision-making, but also forethought about what it means um, in terms of how we train undergraduates as part of this ecosystem of creating graduate students. And also the what types of supports and community the graduate students we admit need and deserve. So if we're targeting a diverse student body, what does it look like to also uh, target a healthy, um, a, a healthy and well supported graduate student body? All right, and that um, brings me to kind of our final question and set of tenets that we have to ask. Um, so if we have taken up and designed um, a meaningful change initiative, how do we make sure that it actually kind of has the desired impact? So what if it just becomes a policy on the books 
but not in practice, right? Which we see fairly often. So first, research indicates that the way actors make sense of the need for new approaches or policies dictates whether and to what extent changes are enacted. So in other words, folks need to believe that the change is either or both important or unavoidable. And when it comes to issues of anti-racism, as we have seen, backlash and a sense of not belonging in anti-racist work can really get in the way of progress. So we can expect kind of meaningful implementation when intentional sense giving occurs in an organization that helps folks across the organization feel a sense of responsibility um, and agency in this work, right? So this can't just be someone else's job. It can't be ceremonial. Um, so in one of um, some of my ongoing research looking across um, a number of higher education organizations that have launched um, particular types of uh, racial equity initiatives, one of the big differenti differentiating factors that I've seen between um, organizations who've made significant progress in the shift of their organizational culture and um, those who've been kind of treading water is this experience of feeling this, I, I don't know if this will sound um, easily accessible, but feeling enrolled in the work. So the organizations that have made the most progress have had a lot of meaning making occur um, among participants to find even for um, folks who are brand new to thinking about racial equity and who you know hold white or white appearing identities um, to feel enrolled and included as actors who have a job to do within the larger organization. Um, so in organizations and departments and contexts where folks uh, really see the enactment of the work as the job of either one identified, let's say, um, chief diversity officer or uh, director of diversity within a school, or who see anti-racist work as being um, honestly the work of the people of color in the department, which happens, um, feeling like, the, you know, I don't know, I don't have the expertise, I'm just going to stay out of it. Um, those are the places where even when formal policies might be adopted that show promise for advancing kind of equity in a space, um, it can really kind of get stalled out because there's no distributed leadership and distributed sense of care and responsibility, right? So second, um, there is a lot of rhetoric out there about data-driven decision-making in higher education, right? Data-driven decision-making will be the key to all kinds of things. Um, and one of those tends to include racial equity. So there's been a big drive in higher education over the last decade plus to use data in new ways and specifically disaggregated data to understand and target racial inequities. However, I'm sure you've heard and probably said this, right? Data don't drive on their own um, and data can be used for many purposes and many directions. So for example, um, in my work and the work of others, we've seen you know, a college that decides it's going to make changes to increase its four-year graduation rates in a major for students of color specifically and for kind of the community collectively, they might kind of take this idea of being data-driven and look at disaggregated data about student outcomes by various identity groups. Um, and they might even you know, create large kind of community listening sessions using disaggregated data to try to target um, change in a department or a school. However, data showing inequities can be used right, in many ways, including to argue a case for less access to college to avoid the quote unquote high risk students. So these are, um, you know, these are ways of thinking about what disaggregated data show us that come up all the time um, in um, racial equity change initi initiatives. Or of course, data could be used to make a case for institutional change or pedagogical change in key courses, right? So it can really go um, either way. It can reify existing negative stereotypes about students and guide us to make decisions in that way. Or um, it can push us to reflect differently on internal 
organizational practices and make changes that we might not have otherwise. So, and to this end, the outcome here will look like a shift in material resources, which can mean dollars, voice, agency to make decisions among and to minoritized communities. And I'll speak to this um, in the context of the next example. So let's say, uh, for instance, we are a math department looking at our student outcomes and noticing a significant failure to serve Latin and indigenous students um, to completion. And in particular, uh, early courses in the program. So what would it take to achieve that change? What would it take to introduce something like culturally responsive pedagogy? So first, an equity first mentality across decision makers and faculty, right? It would be easy to use data to reason that students should um, just receive remediation before they're allowed into a major. But what does that effectively do? This creates increased burden and decreases resources and agency among minoritized students, right? So we know that, uh, cool, that cooling out occurs when we move one group of students into a remediation sequence rather than um, admitting them directly into a particular and desired program. So an equity first mindset is going to use inequitable outcomes to not only identify change, because that would be a form of change, but identify change that does not create new pockets of inequity, in this case, a form of tracking. This might mean significant uh, pedagogical and support change in key courses, which would yeah, avoid the elongation of pathways and expense, right? That, that costs students money. Um, expense for students associated with remediation focused solutions. And again, this means routinely using resources, even when limited, because they always are, to remedy systemic inequities rather than focusing on changing the student. All right, so in this instance, thinking about advancing uh, culturally responsive, uh, responsive pedagogy in the classroom um, rather than you know, moving to remediation or just not changing. Um, so a measure that we always go to would be college completion, right? Um, but we have a lot of steps along the way to get to moving the needle, as we always say, on college completion as an outcome. And it's useful here, as in the other cases, to think about what are milestones we can think about along the way, right? So as I alluded to before, you know, a distributed sense of responsibility for equitable outcomes. So something like culturally responsive pedagogy would require um, a lot of faculty, a lot of staff, many actors to take equitable responsibility for a change, right? Um, it's really different than introducing, um, you know, a new parking lot for remediation for students, which could be somebody else's job. It's not going to work um, with, something like introducing uh, a more responsive pedagogy into uh, a number of key courses. We also have you know, learn and apply the use of evidence to change institutions, not students. We also think about um, how initiatives like this would shift resources, um, even when limited to minoritized communities. Okay, so in, in just a few moments, um, I wanna pause and have some time for just open Q&A um, to clarify anything that came up. And then we will move into, I wanna transition us after that into small groups, just to think through the initiative that you have been holding in mind. But first, um, I do wanna speak to something to look out for or be attuned to in this work. So talking about racialized change work, right? The goal of it is to tear down racialized, a racialized mode of reproduction or more than one. But it's not always a one directional process. And we actually see patterns where when one kind of mode of reproduction is torn down or weakened, a new one often crops up in its place, right? So race and racism are often fluid like that. Um, and in the example I just gave, right? Moving students into remedial programming has often um, for the purpose of increasing access is a really common type of mechanism um, where we really have, now we're maybe admitting more students of color, right? We have a, a new type of pathway, so that's great. We have weakened one 
um, mode of reproduction, which is complete lack of access, but we also created a new way of racializing and cooling out the educational process for some students more than others. So this happens too in faculty hiring. So think, for example, of the many kind of race and equity cluster hires that have occurred in recent years, um, especially since 2020. So, okay, great. We're diversifying the academy. But what happens after folks are hired? Right? Are they facing extra racialized labor um, within their department? Are they equitably supported through tenure? Um, are there commitments to justice, which we valued in their scholarship enough to have a cluster hire, for example, equally valued in the tenure process? And something that's, um, you know, sneaky and insidious and definitely happening um, is are folks treated by colleagues as being lesser because they're, they're perceived as a diversity hire? And of course, as I started this presentation with, or if you're in Florida, is the work you do now outlawed? Um, luckily, we're not right now uh, in this space in that context, but it is something um, to kind of think through, which is it's helpful to keep in mind the way that racialization is fluid and can shift from one mechanism to another. And so the ways that we kind of work in groups to um, you know, weaken racialization, just keeping an eye on is there unintentionally kind of a new mode of reproduction we're putting into place? And that can happen intentionally and unintentionally depending on the context and it's useful to surface here. So with, I wanna just pause, I'm gonna stop the share for a moment so I can see everybody. Um, so before we move into some small groups and I'll give a prompt for that before we go anywhere. Um, and I would be great just to check in and see via chat or um, just unmute yourself out loud if there's any questions, confusions that I can speak to before we have time to have some discussion. I think, do I see a hand? Sorry. Yes, so oh, hey. uh, I had a question about how your idea of uh, moving from race neutral to anti-racist might fit in the context of imposter syndrome. So the reason this comes up is for the past four or five years, I teach at the law school and a lot of my law students have now adopted the vocabulary of imposter syndrome. But there was a nice article in the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago and then recently sort of mentioned in the New Yorker about how talking about imposter syndrome puts the onus, particularly for women of color, on themselves and not at the system. And I wondered how you might guide me uh, or the rest of us in dealing with imposter syndrome or counseling folks who are working through it. Is it a helpful label? Is it just reproduce the racialized modes of production that you're talking about? How do we navigate that balance? Patrick, that's such a good question that I hadn't thought about in that way. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I think it's a really powerful example because it's um, it's almost become a really nice kind of colloquial way that folks have picked up to take a systemic noticing, which is there's groups of folks who don't feel like they belong, right? Let's just put it, that's a simple way, right? They don't feel like they belong. And we're gonna just really focus and think about the fact what, what it feels like and how it's enacted kind of bodily to be like, oh, I don't belong in this space. People are gonna find me out, that type of thing, right? But, but what you're pointing out, and I believe if I remember the New Yorker article is pointing out, and if not this New Yorker article, it was a, maybe a response to it, is that what's being experienced is actually not a syndrome. It's a very real reaction to either a lifelong set of experiences or an institutional set of experiences that is delivered message after message that you in fact don't belong. And so one thing that imposter syndrome, because of the word syndrome, it's actually pathologizing something that's a very real and lucid reaction to messaging that we've received. So in terms of how do we think about systemic, responses, um, 
I, I want to think about how is that showing up? So I would say thinking about in the case of imposter syndrome, almost um, one of the modes of reproduction we could play with, right? Like in a small discussion would be um, where are, where is it talked about? And where, where is there silence, right? So thinking about um, what are the opportunities in mentorship relationships and, you know, um, classroom experiences, that sort of thing to actually give voice, right? To this idea that a lot of people experience imposter syndrome. Here's a reframing, right? And then here's what we're, what we're doing about it. Here's how we're asserting who belongs here and normalizing rather than pathologizing, right? That you feel this way. So it's something I'd wanna think about of how do we embed that systemically? But I think the flip of, are we focusing on how somebody has doesn't have enough confidence because they feel like an imposter and we should tell them to be more confident as opposed to really thinking about what does it look like in our institution to convey that we understand that folks are coming. For example, I teach statistics. Let me give, in, in our school of education, I teach statistics for quantitative research. I get a lot of students who come in um, with what we call, some of us call math trauma, right? So I get a lot of women of color who come in who, I mean, their visceral reaction to like, you have to be in the stats class to get your PhD is like all over their face and body when I first meet them, right? And so, I mean, I so I call attention to this thing I call math trauma. I, I personally share story, a story about that experience. That's not something everybody can do, but it's a, you know, something I do. And then I actually speak to the series of experiences we know from research exists that has led you to feel like you are math phobic. Cause I will hear that. Oh no, I'm, you know, I have this math phobia. I'm terrible at it. And it is a patterned response, right, to a socialization process that everybody's been through. So our first day conversation about, I do, I've done a waterfall activity. Describe your relationship to math today. And I'll have people say the funniest things like, oh, we, we used to, I used to hate it, but now she and I kick it. I've had other students say things um, like I run the other way as fast as I can and kind of normalizing a conversation of it's a relationship with math that you've had for a long time. And then normalizing anybody can become strong in the use of statistics, right? In this class, here's how, you know, here's how we're going to normalize that if you get a first bad exam, it doesn't mean that you're bad at statistics. Here's what it does mean, right? And really trying to structure out how in this particular classroom environment, like we're rejecting the bad at math label and we're thinking about it developmentally and how we're going to improve along the way. So I think. That's one example of how I try to take it on in my space, but I think it takes a lot of, um, thank you, David, for throwing another resource in here. I'm going to, and I see the quotes around imposter syndrome. I think that's probably how I would type it too. So I think that's useful, uh, but hopefully that gives you something to think, to, to talk about a bit more, but I think it's an excellent example of kind of flipping the script. Thank you. And I, I think the, the language is a good place to focus. The creators of the term in the original paper prefer imposter phenomenon or mm -hmm. imposter feelings. So it right. doesn't feel like it's a disease that you brought on yourself. It's more of the environment you're in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a realistic response to a pattern of events. Um, any other questions, comments uh, before we move into small groups? Okay, um, so I believe Kristen's going to help out. Well, oh, before we go, sorry. Ooh, I got excited about that question. Forgot to tell you what we're doing. One second here. Okay, so in um, these, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, if I could, the article that I just sent addresses precisely what you were just um, uh, speaking about. It suggests that. Um, blame is effectively adopted uh, by individuals and <laughs> constitute groups adopted from the system. It's installed in this system. And uh, Mark Fisher relates it to um, really deeply ingrown uh, class issues. It's a very powerful article. Um, Thank you. If you're interested. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to grab that. Um while, or I'll grab the link while you all are in small groups. Um, and also glad to hear that this discussion aligned with it. 
I was able also to relate to it quite personally. Awesome. Thank you, David, for sharing that. Anybody else before? I don't want to cut anybody off. Okay. All right. So um, I have up on the screen what I'm hoping you can uh, speak about in small groups. Um, before we actually go into the small groups, I'm going to drop it into the chat. That way it stays with you when you go into your separate rooms. Um, so I want you to share kind of the initial, a little bit more information about that initial program or policy you had in mind and how you were thinking about measuring its success. Um, if there are any new ways, any ideas that struck you, um, thinking about what it would take to advance the work, other ways you could think about kind of interim measures or steps um, to achieve the goal, any new questions or concerns that are coming up for you, and then just a chance to offer feedback and ideas uh, about how you might shift or reimagine initiatives to bring about racialized change. And something, again, I'll drop this in the chat so you have it, that I would love for you to do is I've created um, a Padlet. And I'll look at how many groups we have at the end. But you can look at your group number. And in this Padlet, they'll already have some group numbers set up. And so you can, as you think about insights, new ideas, if you wouldn't mind just hitting respond on your kind of your group uh, Padlet uh, box that you'll see. So we can kind of collect some insights across the groups to, to bring back. And if they're useful, then we also have a place where they live um, thereafter. So I'm going to leave this screen for a moment so that I can actually grab this text and put it into the chat so that it goes with you. And then Kristen is gonna send us into small groups and we will go for about 20 minutes. Um, I'll check in with a few groups and we'll call you back earlier if you're wrapping up sooner so we can have a, a kind of large group closing. So that posted it as an image, but it looks like it's openable. You can open that. And then I will put this link here to the Padlet. And sorry, Heather, did you say 20 minutes? Yeah, 20 okay. minutes. Okay. But we'll, I'll do a broadcast if I um, hop in and notice folks wrapping okay. up early. Sounds good. Maybe a hyper individualistic industry or area being in academia. Um, so I don't want to answer too broadly, but one of the things, you know, if we were, let's say if we're in a small working group thinking about a particular area of practice um, that we want to transform and we're thinking about it in this particular way, um, there we probably want to try to identify, right? If we think about uh, X issue is being um, reproduced kind of automatically via X, Y, Z routine. And usually part of this routine is that depending on who you get on this committee in this group, there's gonna be wildly variable outcomes because if you happen to have two of our big obstructors in the department, you know that, you know, this isn't going to go down in an equitable or transformative way. If you happen to get a group that's all on board and ready to make some certain types of changes, right? So that's where we think about this like decoupling of if it's all up to the luck of the draw of who participates, then we are often going to have inconsistent results. So at that point, we'd be thinking about how do we set up checks and balances or processes, not that would say, okay, XYZ person can't participate, but how do we introduce certain types of routines that we that we think could help balance that out on an automatic level? So it's not gonna eliminate that. Um, that's not the world we live in, but um, thinking about, and I'm sometimes, you know, thinking about best examples on the spot, but um, one example that will often come up again, um, in either admissions or hiring processes will be particular checkpoints where there's certain types of data that we check in with, right? We, we review for just something very simple. This is not transformative, but you know, did we at least go from our full candidate pool to our finalist pool in a way that, you know, at least our, our, our finalist pool is representative kind of racially of our candidate pool. And that's something we have committed, that's where, what we're going to do, we're going to check it, and we're going to revisit if needed. Again, this isn't the most kind of transformative routine, but if that is routine for every committee who does a particular type of hiring or admissions process, then it's not up to, 
you know, X, Y, Z person to be like, hey, I don't think the pool is as diverse as it could be given who we had to choose from. It's, uh, oh no, this is the next step that we fulfill. And maybe we have one person assigned, right? Who has the power to stop the group and say, we haven't done that step every single time. Um, so there's much more, like we can go a little deeper and push further with the example, but just thinking about what are those ways we build in routine structures that everyone just does. We normalize it. It's not up for debate. It just becomes part of the way this is done and the department works, right? Um, and those are kind of, so those are the types of checks we can start to introduce and normalize and routinize so that even the worst composition of a group in terms of interest in racial equity still has a higher floor <laughs> than they would have. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so that's how I, I would think about it and approach it kind of in a small working group. Thank you for that question. I think that's the obstructors it's a real tension. Um, other thoughts or problem solving or um, even just positive ideas that came out of your talk with your colleagues. Time has come for violent revolution. Sounds good to I'm me. I'm just playing, of course, but it seems <laughs> that the system continues to reproduce itself. Yeah. And there is such uh, like there's such a massive capacity to to do that. And the policies are so broad and so spread over so many different institutions that any step forward feels nominal at best. And in a department such as as mine, it's art history. Um, there are long historical roots mm -hmm. in um, the discipline and extending out of uh, issues related to class, class interests. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that tends to reproduce itself um, in various discourses within this department itself, even in places where um, where change could happen, compelling mm -hmm. changes could happen. Mm -hmm. I find that kind of disturbing. I mean, I think that's what got me into this work. In fact, I started as an art history undergrad a billion years ago and I loved it. I wanted to get my PhD in it. And there were certain things that made me feel like a student like me couldn't do that. And that is quite literally what launched me into wanting to pursue this type of line of work was to say, well, but they say, you know, all these diversity things, these initiatives, they say they want folks like me or like other people, um, but it doesn't seem to be sticking. So I do agree. It is um, overwhelming on many days, um, but finding those small, you know, the, the best, we don't want to just demand incremental change. We do want to demand much, much more than that. Um, so how do we how do we strategically find ways to make these things stick? It's not an easy question. Um, I wish I had the silver bullet, but I have a few things that can be helpful at least. Yeah. Oh, I see. Let's do, how about Sarah and then Patrick? So, yeah. And this up first if you want to go first. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. No, that's all right. I just, you sure? Yeah. Um, I was just going to raise another one where I don't think that we had a great solution, but we were talking about faculty recruitment or faculty hiring and student admissions and thinking about the way in which um, many of the metrics that we use as currency in our field being like the number of papers and the number of grants and things like that is very closely tied <laughs> to where you come from and what access you had and did you have enough money to work for free, you know, and, and volunteer in a research lab. And so we were talking briefly about how you try and distinguish, you know, um, potential from privilege. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if anyone had thoughts on that, because I don't think we have found a solution for how you do that well. So 
So I, I just want to emphasize that those types of criteria are exactly that, like you said, the types of things we, we have to contend with to say, okay, so number of publications obviously at the surface is not a racialized or identity focused construct, but it correlates highly. So if we're going to live in that reality, what is it that we can do about it? And what types of changes need to occur to metrics? So that's something we could um, do a deeper dive on, but I, I am curious, does anybody who wasn't in that small group have thoughts that they want to kind of put out there? Anything that you have tried in terms of pushing back on the way those criteria tend to operate? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure as as a member of the EI committee here for the last couple of years, I've often been baffled by just what it is that um, we can actually accomplish. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Um, but I was wondering if one way here, at least in this department, and I don't know if this would echo anyplace else, um, if it might not fall on each of us in some way to bring newness to the department, not through ourselves, but through, say, inviting people to speak, to, to present voices that, um, to keep other voices to keep many voices in the red bar within the scope as a constant flow of compelling disruptions. And I don't know, I don't know how else you do that except by changing the languages of the discourse to, to manage what it is that we that we're doing ourselves, modeling. Mm -hmm. You know, because I think the system is just too big. I mean, it implicates I think, all of us in one way, but we feel like imposters or like we own the place. I think the point about discourse is really valuable because I think the Sarah, what you're talking about is the the way that certain types of metrics get converted into a discourse of you know excellence and achievement um, when we're looking over somebody's materials and taking a moment to what is the phrase? It's making um, making the everyday strange again. And so really kind of questioning what on a CV or in somebody's repertoire is it that stands out as the thing that makes them excellent, right? So there's a lot of things that show up that we don't, we skim over on a CV that can express a whole lot of qualities that somebody would bring into our space that doesn't get converted into that type of discourse, not because it can't, right? It's just, this is how we've this is the system we're inheriting. And so thinking about what are new ways that we could introduce different metrics that could outweigh, not outweigh, but also weigh into these conversations, you know, are, again, we could pick this up, but there's, there are experiments kind of out there in the field around, okay, how would you operationalize wanting to see um, how somebody, how somebody's um, trajectory you know, they have two publications, not eight, but like, how do we actually look at the quality of what they're producing and look at it in the context of their trajectory um, and also other contributions they've made to community and beyond as equally important to quality and excellence. So um, I want to, I want to hear what Patrick was going to throw out there, but it's something I'd be really happy to talk about more. Uh, also, Sarah. So I know we're uh, running out of time. Yeah. So I, I guess I could end with uh, uh, bright spots and two bright ideas. The, I was in the group with Zach and Belinda and the bright spot was we were talking about peer tutoring uh -huh. as a way to get around this. And Belinda said that she had a really successful program in public health um, that was somewhat dependent on funding. So the bright idea was experiment what we've done at the law school because we had a funding issue is give people who want to be tutors um, credit instead uh -huh. of money. So yeah. it also frees up time in their schedule. And that was, um, uh, that we've seen a good effect there. And Belinda had the suggestion of, if you're running into faculty resistance to having someone help out with a course, uh, 
see if you can pick who gets to teach the introductory courses and find faculty who are more open to uh, having that kind of peer-to-peer -peer stuff. So it's stepping back at the faculty level and actually helping student belonging and interaction, which I thought was really, really helpful. Yeah, strategically placing uh, faculty with particular commitments um, to student progress in key courses is, is not a bad idea at all and could be really important to a lot of students. Um, so with that, I realized that we, thank you for sharing that. I know we're a minute past. Um, there's my email address. Please feel free to follow up. I've really enjoyed this opportunity and it looks like there's also a feedback form and, and definitely happy to hear that feedback to Rackham. And also if there's anything I should know, I would love to hear it too. So thank you. I'll leave it to, to Rita to wrap us up there. Just to say thank you for giving us some time this afternoon. Um, we really appreciate your presence here. I, for one, learned a ton from this uh, um, opportunity to interact with um, uh, Professor McCambly. And um, we've got a um, final substantive workshop coming up, I believe, in March, mid-March. Um, and it will be our own Mallory Martin Ferguson, who will be um, talking about and sort of leading us through exercises around how to have difficult conversations. Um, so um, with that, I hope you have a good um, six weeks or so, and hopefully we'll see you at the next workshop. Thank you again, um, Professor Camley, McCamley. It's really been a pleasure having you with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.